Hello, my name is Grant Kramer and I'm a professor at the University of Nevada, Reno. And today I would like to talk to you about irrigation, how to irrigate and when to irrigate your vines. But before I do that, let me explain this photo. This is a place that I've been in the world. This is the great Douro Valley in Portugal where many of the delicious Portuguese wines are made. And it's an incredible place with a large river and hills and vineyards everywhere. I highly recommend going there. Okay, irrigation. So irrigation is very, very important in our kind of environment. We have very little rainfall and therefore we need to supply the plants with some water. And water is so important because it makes up the greatest quantity or proportion of the plant body. It's the most important thing we can give the plant to help it grow. It helps in growing, it helps in photosynthesis, the production of sugars, and it also impacts the fruit quality. So the water uptake into the vine is dependent upon the water supply to the roots, and the transpiration rate out of the leaves, which affects the overall water status of the vine. Okay, so let's start with a few irrigation principles. Soils are the reservoir for water, and there are different soil types which have different water holding capacities due to the different particle sizes in the soil. Clay being the finest has holds the most water. Silt is intermediate, holding in less water than clay, but more water than sand, which has the largest size particles. You can add organic matter to your soil, which will improve the water holding capacity of the soil, as well as the aeration and drainage of water through the soil. And soils vary. They're a mixture of these types of particles. They vary by type and they vary by depth in any particular single vineyard. You could have a few vines in one vineyard exposed to a different soil type than another in another part of the vineyard. Soil is highly variable. Water availability. So the amount of water that is available uh, to your vines is dependent, as I just mentioned, on the soil type. It's also dependent on the water quality. That is, if you have really clean snowmelt type water or you have salty water. Salty water the more salt in the water, the less easy it is for the grapevines to take up that water. It's kind of an osmotic effect, just like you wouldn't drink seawater versus good clean water. The percentage of water in the soil also impacts how easy it is for the vine to extract that water from the soil. The less water in the soil, the harder it is for that vine to extract the water. The amount of active roots in that part of the soil. soil. So if the overall soil appears to be dry, you may have roots growing into an area that you don't detect underground or to the side where they're getting, the roots are getting that water from another section. So just by measuring the soil right around the vine may not be the source of the water because you don't know where those roots are growing. For example, you could just be measuring the soil surface and your roots go down 10 feet deep. In fact, I've seen in the world in certain places where roots have gone down 50 feet into the soil. So the deeper root systems are gonna be able to access water further down in the soil. On the other hand, if you have a very shallow soil, then your roots are not gonna be able to grow down at all and you're going to have to apply more water. And then we've seen where roots in one row will literally grow right across the row and over to the other row next to it and get water from the nearby row. So if one row is getting water and the other one is not, those plants may be accessing water from a different row. Okay, great water quality. So grapevines are very drought tolerant, but they're moderately salt sensitive. They're sensitive to sodium, chloride, and boron. In part, because these salts can be toxic to the vines, they're not needed necessarily in these amounts, 
in the vines and they accumulate over the years because vines are perennials that they eventually become toxic. So it's recommended that your water quality should have concentrations of sodium less than 20 millimolar, less than four millimolar chloride, and less than one part per million for boron. Boron's a micronutrient, and you need it in very small amounts, but when it becomes higher than that, uh, say in the five parts per million range particularly, uh, you're going to kill the vines. So vines are very, very, as plants are in general, very, very sensitive to too much boron. And boron is often associated with sodium and chloride in saline soils. So these are three important nutrients that you want to check on in your water quality before you're irrigating with it. Okay, what are the needs for grapevines for water? They really need surprisingly little amounts of water. In experiments that we've done at the UNR vineyards over a number of years, we've shown that we've been able to produce good quality grapes with good production at one twelfth the amount of water than you would apply to an average alfalfa field on a per acre basis. In addition, overwatering can be really bad for your grapes. That is, the grapevines don't like wet feet. They prefer drier soils with good drainage. Newly planted young vines will obviously need more water as they don't have established root systems and are very shallow. Mature vines, on the other hand, have well-developed root systems, which may go quite deeply. Their requirements for water will be less in some ways because you'll have a bigger reservoir of soil for water, but at the same time, they'll be using more water because they'll have a bigger body a bigger leaf area that will transpire more water. Water needs will differ between cultivars. Some cultivars are more water use efficient than others. And rootstocks have been selected that do better in wet soils or other kinds, which are riparia based rootstocks, or there are other rootstocks that have been developed from wild grapes that have been growing in dry area it's like Ramsey from Texas. Now, more importantly, your grapevine is going to have different times during the season when it's going to need water more than at another time. And these times in particular that are important are flowering and fruit set, from veraison to harvest and after harvest. So flowering and fruit set, water needs. Flowering and fruit set are inhibited by water set deficit. You do not want a water deficit during flowering and fruit set. It's going to affect your clusters and your yield. Be sure to irrigate your vines before this sensitive stage if you do not have any significant rainfall. Oftentimes in the spring we get good rainfall we have good soils with good water holding capacity and we don't need to irrigate. But some winters are dry and therefore we do need to irrigate. So I generally irrigate just before flowering just to be sure that we have an adequate water supply. Again, the amount to, to irrigate is dependent upon your soil type, the depth of your soil and your rooting depth. Obviously with sandy soils and shallow roots, you would need more frequent watering. Okay, from veraison to harvest, there's less need for water at this stage. Fruit will continue to develop with very little water. In fact, water deficits inhibit shoot tip growth, allowing sugars to be redirected to the fruit, which can accelerate sugar accumulation in your berries and water deficits can impact your fruit quality. Mild water deficits improve fruit color and fruity aromas. Severe water deficit will shut down photosynthesis and inhibit color development in the berries or even cause berry shrivel. Post-harvest, your berries are collected, but you wanna get the energy back levels back up in your vine by 
irrigating them again, as long as you have good leaves on the vines, you wanna get photosynthesis going to supply the sugars to your roots and your trunk to provide better conditions for the plants to survive over the winter and to also to provide energy or that storage starch necessary to come out of the trunks and roots in the springtime to help support your flowering and fruit set. Irrigation during the winter is risky. It's risky business. If freezing temperatures occur after your irrigation, you will get ice formation and this ice formation can cause the trunks to split. It also can just cause some ice damage to the trunks, which will allow crown gall formation to develop and thus ultimately causing the dieback of, of your trunk and you'll have to start a new trunk. So I do not recommend irrigation during the winter, if at all possible. Water's not really needed during this time. The vines have gone dormant and they don't have any leaves, so they're not transpiring any water. So they're relatively tolerant and we traditionally have not irrigated our vines over the winter. And as a general rule, they've survived just fine. I know this is in opposition to what some local television stations and cooperative extension people are saying, but I do not see the rationale for irrigating your plants in the winter time. Even my own backyard, I do not water my plants. I've never lost any plants during the winter. They've all survived, including the grass, which has very shallow root systems. Okay, irrigation scheduling for young vines. I would recommend that you water every other day after planting them to get those vines established. You want to water them as deeply as possible. Watering less frequently and more deeply is better because it will encourage your roots to grow deeper down into those areas below the surface. If you just water frequently along the surface, you'll establish root systems along the surface, but they won't grow deeply and you won't develop a root system that you want that is deep and will survive dry conditions and use your water more efficiently. The amount of water that you get and, and even the frequency that you give is going to be dependent again upon your soil type. Obviously you're gonna to need to do more water more frequently with sandy soils versus clay soils. Okay, irrigation scheduling for mature vines. Irrigation should be directed between the vines to encourage root growth away from the trunk, preventing root rot around the trunk. We've seen this where drippers were placed at the top of the vine in the first year and continued to be irrigated over the top of the vine right where the trunk goes into the ground. And we see that because of the excessive amount of water, that rot begins to start in that region of the plant and the plant dies. So we recommend irrigation as soon as you can between the vines to encourage root growth away from the trunk. And I wouldn't do this in the first year, but in the second year, I would start to do that. You wanna make sure that you're giving adequate water at flowering time, as I discussed before. You want to reduce your watering after fruit set because this improves fruit quality and inhibits the shoot tip growth, putting more energy into the fruit and less energy into shoot growth. So water is being used to control the vigor of your vines, which is very important. We want moderate vigor, not excessive vigor. If you give too much water, you're gonna create excessive vigor, which is gonna affect your fruit quality and redirect energy to the shoots instead of into the fruit. And it will also create vigorous shoots at the end of the season, which will not harden off properly and not be more protected during the dormant period, they'll be more susceptible to cold injury. So then you continue to water as needed, depending on whether you're doing water potential measurements or you're looking at your tendrils to determine how much you need to maintain those moderate deficit levels. At some point, you're gonna to need to stop irrigation before harvest. This is typically done in most vineyards 
usually between two to four weeks before harvest to allow those grapes to ripen up and mature. This will allow sugars to accumulate more rapidly. If you continue to water heavily, you will dilute the grapes and sugar development will be slower. So again, you can use water here to manipulate that. And then after you harvest, you wanna make sure you start irrigating again. If you can, you were not, your harvest was not because of a frost and you have leaves, you wanna to continue to irrigate until those leaves are lost in some sort of frost event and they go dormant. At that point, no more water is needed to be added. So how to determine the grapevine water status. You can measure the water availability in the soil. One caveat here is that the soil that wherever you detect that water is not necessarily where your roots are. So if you're measuring in a shallow soil and your roots are down deep, it's not going to tell you exactly what the water availability is. This is a problem with measuring with the soil. I prefer to measure the water availability of the vine because the vine then can tell you whether it's getting access to water or not. You cannot know where its root system is, but its water status will tell you whether your roots are getting an adequate supply of water. Another way that you can do that is by observing the plant, looking at the length of the shoot tendrils is one of those ways, and it's very easy. You don't require a device to measure the water status. And you can do a calculation. You can use weather-based predictions to calculate out whether your plants have been using water or need water. Measuring the water status of the soil can be done by a number of ways. I'm not going to go into them in any significant detail, but you can obviously dig into the soil, feel the soil, look at the soil, and determine whether there's water there. But there are devices that have been developed to measure water, such as tensiometers, moisture blocks, or expensive neutron probe that scientists use, or there are electronic sensors. But as I said, I prefer to use the plant's water status rather than the soil water status to determine how much water is available to the plant. So how do we do this? Well, we use a term called the water potential, which is a measure of the free energy of water. I'm trying not to be too scientific for you, but basically we use something called a pressure chamber and we measure the water tension in the xylem of the plant. The tension is a reflection of the amount of stress. The more tension there is, the less water there is available to do work for things like growth or biochemistry. So here's a device that we use or could use. We use something a little bit more expensive than this one. So I'm presenting this one because it is sort of affordable at $1,500 for this device. Um, most people probably aren't gonna afford to go out and get that either, but some of you may. And this is a pressure chamber that works, in this case, kind of like a bicycle pump. And basically what you do is you cut off a leaf, you place it inside this chamber here, and you pump it up with pressure to force water out of the petiole, which is sticking out of the top of this device. Here is a, an expanded view of that where you can see water coming out of the top of the petiole and you record or look at the pressure on the gauge that it took to force that water out. So pressure is opposite of tension. So the amount of pressure is an indication of how much water stress you have. The more pressure you have to use, the more tension you have in the vine, which means you have more stress. So this is a direct measure of the plant's water status. But you can measure water status by observation. If you simply look at the shoot tips under well-watered conditions, that shoot tip is going to have a lightish green yellow color to it. Vines that have water stress, they're going to be a darker green to even a greenish gray color. But the method that I like to use most is the length of the shoot internodes and the tendrils. In particular, the tendrils are very sensitive, more so than the internodes. So water deficit vines have reduced internode length and tendril size. If there are no tendrils or 
the apical meristem, the tips of the shoots are dead, brown and not growing, this indicates you've reached a very severe stress. So this is what I mean by looking at the tendril size between a tendril between two to four inches in length is just about right. So in the center picture here on Cabernet Sauvignon, you can see the size of this tendril. On the left here, the tendrils are much larger, which indicates that you've given them too much water. They're growing too vigorously. And so you would want to back off on water. And if you looked in the one on the right, you can see a very small tendril. And there's only one, there's very few tendrils developing here. This is an indication and inner nodes are getting small between the leaves. This is an indication that you have too little water and you should be applying more water than you have been. Okay, and finally, weather-based methods. In order to use this, you need access to information from a weather station. At Washoe County, they have an ET site where you can measure the evapotranspiration for a grass and calculate out the amount of water needed for that grass over, say, a week. And I'll explain this in a little bit more detail. Obviously, the amount of water that the grass uses is dependent upon the temperature in the day and the humidity, the wind, and a few other factors. So they put this into the calculation at the site. And you all, all you have to do is look it up on the, on the weather station site. And you can get that information to make your calculation. Once you have that information, you need to adjust it to grapevines because grapevines use less water than an acre of grass would do because they're more efficient in the use of their water, but also because they don't cover the entire surface of the soil. So you need to reduce the area of use in that acre of land. And typically we've used 20% of that grass value. That then tells us how much water that grapevine has used over that week. We don't necessarily want to put back the full amount of water that was lost. In fact, what we do is a deficit type irrigation, which improves the quality of the grapes and continues to produce just as much yield when we irrigate at 80% of that volume. If we want to induce a bit more stress, then we might grow them at 60% water deficit, but I wouldn't go any lower than that where you start to see more significant reductions in yield and perhaps poorer quality. So let's go through those calculations. So great evapotranspiration can be calculated and to get more useful information about how to do this, you can go to a number of sites. Here on the top is the Washoe ET site, which is a source of information for you based on grass, and you can read about it there at that site. But another useful resource is at this agrilife.org site for wine grapes, where he, Ed Hellman, a cooperative extension agent in Texas, goes through the calculations that I'm going to go through here to tell you how to calculate the amount of water to apply to an individual grape vine. So here is a site for where you can get the actual Penman ET for the calculation for grass in terms of inches of water used per acre. All you have to do is go to this website and it will tell you on a daily basis how much water was used from that gray grass. So to make that calculation, that Penman ET equation, it's called other things as well, I have to estimate what my water requirement is. To do that, I, est I get the estimate for grass, which is called ETO here and I multiply it by this crop coefficient that I was talking about, which I told you was about 20% to get the amount of water needed or used for grapes. So if our grass used 0.3 inches of water in that day and over an average of a week, we would be using 2.1 inches of water that was lost from the ground for that acre of grass. And that we call ETO. We could simply replace all that water that was lost and put it back into the grass as we would probably if we were watering our lawns. But grapes, as I mentioned, are more efficient in their water use. They use less water and they don't cover the entire surface area 
of that acre of land. So we use a crop coefficient 20%. And by multiplying that 2.1 inches by 20%, we've actually only used 0.42 inches of water per acre. So how do we get that calculation of inches of water per acre into gallons of water that we need to add to our grapevine? Well, we need to do a few calculations here. So we take that 4.42 inches and we multiply it by this conversion for gallons per acre of inch. So 27,152 gallons per acre inch equals 11,404 gallons per acre that we would want to apply. But we want to adjust this to our grapevine area, which is 32 square feet in this particular calculation. Yours may be different depending on the density of your grapevine planting, but we would take that and convert it to by calculating out 11,404 gallons per acre times 32 square feet divided by the 43,560 square feet we have in an acre. So that comes to 11,404 gallons per acre times 0 0.000735, which gives us a water requirement to replace all the water lost to 15.51 gallons per vine. However, we're practicing deficit irrigation. We don't need to put the entire water amount of water lost. So we would multiply this by 80% or 0 0.8, and we come up with 12.4 gallons of water per vine. Okay. What system should you irrigate with? Well, we recommend the drip system. It's a much more efficient system than flood or furrow irrigation. Recommend having a timer on that system so that you can apply more precise amounts of water. And that will be dependent upon the size emitters that you're using. So we use two or four gallon inline emitters. That is two to four gallons per hour. And we have two emitters, one on each side of the vine. So a two gallon emitter per hour with two emitters is going to emit four gallons per vine per hour. And if we wanted to apply 12 gallons, that would require us to irrigate for three hours. You want your drip line to be hung above the ground on the bottom trellis wire about 12 to 18 inches from the ground. Putting it on the ground could cause the emitters to get plugged by soil and therefore the vine will not get any water with a plugged emitter uh, and your vines will suffer. Emitters should be spaced evenly between the vines as I mentioned and in that first year I would recommend you do that but add spaghetti tubing to direct the water closer to the vines in that first year of growth and thereafter start irrigating between the vines. Okay, now I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and tell you about the impact that deficit irrigation has on the quality of the and growth of the vines. So what is this deficit irrigation? So first of all, if the springtime has been very wet, we don't even apply water in the spring before flowering if there's adequate water in the soil. But if we're unsure, then we would maybe irrigate just before flowering. And thereafter we would stop watering and we would start to measure the stem water potential of our vines and we would not irrigate those vines until they reach a certain stress level and we measure that in a term a pressure term called megapascals and we would get down to what we all these terms are negative I won't go into the theory behind that but when we get down to minus one megapascals that's when we consider to start to reach moderate stress levels and we would start our irrigation at that point. And the very first year that we did this, we didn't start irrigating till mid-July. And we stopped irrigating in mid-August, so we only irrigated for a month of the entire season. So it saves a lot of water and produces better quality grapes, as I mentioned. Once we hit that me minus one megapascal value, 
Then we start applying water only at 75% of the crop ET at this time. I use the work, the value of 80%, 75 or 80% doesn't matter very much. And in this particular case, we were using 75% during this period of time. And as a result of that, over three or four years, we found that we applied much lower water amounts and 12 times less water than the average application to an acre of alfalfa. So in total for the season, we only use 0.27 acre feet of water versus the average of 3.5 acre feet for alfalfa. And when I posted this online at one time, I got calls from Arizona growers going, how can you water with such less water? We're in a big water issue here in Arizona and we're fighting with the administrators regarding the use of water. And this is really good news that you can get away with such little water. And I can testify that we've done this now for 25 years and the grapes have grown just fine. They've been producing adequate production of grapes and high quality grapes. So grape quality is better with this level of irrigation. Here on the left, you can see my graduate student, Elizabeth Tattersall, years ago doing measurements with our pressure chamber to measure the leaf water potential and determine how much water to add to the vineyard or when to start adding water to the vineyard. And as we started this practice, we began to see improved winter survival. So prior to using this regulated deficit irrigation, we were watering the vines on a weekly basis. In 1997 through 2000, you can see we lost 15% or more of our vines. That is, the vines died completely in the wintertime. They didn't just die back to the ground where we could then grow them back up from the roots. The entire plant died, including the roots, and we had to replace 15% or more of our vines each season. But upon reducing our water usage and applying water in this regulated deficit irrigation practice, we immediately increased to 100% survival over the following years. So regulated deficit irrigation definitely improved the survival the winter survival of our grapevines in Northern Nevada. But water deficit also impacts fruit quality, or in this case, I'm going to show you some numbers from the wine that was produced in, from these grapes that were grown with water deficit versus well watered conditions in our experimental vineyard. So we made wines exactly the same way for both well watered and water deficit treated grapes with no additives, no adjustments for TA or sugar or water or any oaking of any kind. So we're just looking with the same yeast, we're just looking at the impacts of the water deficit on wine parameters. So here are some of the factors that we looked at. We looked at pH, titratable acidity, the hue, which is the kind of color the intensity of that color, the luminosity of that color. We looked at monomeric pigments within the wine. We looked at the tannins in that wine. And also we did measurements of total phenols. And in the grapes, we also had measured the bricks and the TA as a comparison and we produce a, a ratio. So what was impacted here by water deficit? Our titratable acidity, was decreased by water deficit. We see a small difference, but a lower amount of titratable acidity, lower acids in our wines. The color was not particularly affected, but the intensity of that color was increased. This in part is probably due to the fact that the grapes are smaller. Because the grapes are smaller, they have a greater surface to volume ratio, meaning a higher proportion of skin is contributing to the wine. And this certainly increases the concentration, but we also saw that the production of these components was increased as well. We saw an increase in monomeric pigments in our red wines here in both Cabernet Sauvignon, and this is the CS 
So I forgot to mention that what WW stands for well watered, WD stands for water deficit. We have CS for Cabernet Sauvignon, C for Chardonnay, and PN for Pinot Noir. So we see an increase in the monomeric pigments by water deficit. We don't see too much effect, but this is varies with the genotype. Obviously, we don't have significant tannins in our Chardonnay, and this was not affected. In our Pinot Noir, it actually kind of went down, but in our Cabernet Sauvignon, it went up considerably. This water deficit has a varietal dependent impact on tannins, and we saw total phenols going up even in the Chardonnay. And we also saw that our Brix to TA ratio went up in the grapes prior to making the wine. Okay, this is a bit of a complicated slide. The take home message is that water deficit improves volatile fruity aromas in wines. But let me explain this slide in a bit of detail because it's something that I didn't publish and it's something I'm actually quite proud of. These are figures of the volatile compounds coming off our wines that were made from either well-watered grapes or water deficit grapes. So the black refers to the well-watered, the orange refers to the water deficit grapes. And this is for Chardonnay grapes or Chardonnay wines and Pinot Noir wines that have been made from those grapes. And what's in these figures are volatile compounds that are coming off and been detected by gas chromatography mass spectrometry, which allows us to identify the compounds very accurately. And we have over 90 volatile compounds that we are able to detect on these wines on a regular basis. So these are averages of wines from three different years in both cases. We're showing here what is consistent from three years of data, not in one year versus another year, which there's quite a bit of variability. These are the average values over three years. So it kind of removes some of those volatiles you might not see in one year or you might see in another year. Okay, what do we have on the y-axis here? Well, these numbered compounds are volatiles that we couldn't identify, and we don't know if they're odor-active compounds for humans. The ones with names on them are known odor-active compounds for humans. That is, we can detect them with our nose if they're in sufficient concentration. So in this case, with Chardonnay, we have an increase, oh, I forgot to mention that the x-axis here is logarithmic. So each one of these points is 10 times more than another, which means that if you see something that looks like a small difference here, like in this case for hexyl acetate, that's actually almost a tenfold increase in concentration there. And hexyl acetate is a fruity aroma. There are other compounds that have very large differences, either increases by water deficit or decreases in water deficit, but we don't know what they are and we don't know if we can detect them. We don't know if these are odor active compounds. In the Pinot Noir, we have two compounds that stand out, phenyl ethanol, these are um, floral aromas, and then the two phenyl ethyl acetate are fruity aromas such as apple or honey, and or rose aromas. Again, we see an increase in these values in our Pinot Noir wines. So the take home message again is that in general for these two varieties at least, the wines that are produced from these water deficit grapes are increasing in fruity aromas. I can say that over several years of doing wine tastings with the public in blind tastings, over 10 different varietals that we've looked at, that people nine times out of 10 preferred the wines that were grown from water deficit grapes over the well watered. Now, I personally didn't find the Riesling grapes to be better when they were treated with water deficit because it increased their petrol character, their petrol notes in the Riesling wines, which is not a characteristic that I like. However, other people did like that. 
So it again comes down to individual taste, but in general, we were tasting with about 30 people a session for two or more years and people preferred the wines that we made from water deficit grapes than from well watered grapes. Okay, so how does, just a little bit of science here, how does uh, hexyl acetate uh, increase in these Chardonnay wines? Well, we did some other analyses of the biochemistry of the grapes themselves and what, how water deficit impacts them. And we found some genes that were, their expression was increased that are part of the hexyl acetate pathway. So this occurs in the grapes. These lipoxygenases convert fatty acids into N-hexanal and that N-hexanal gets converted to N-hexanol by the alcohol dehydrogenases in the grapes. And these are increased by water deficit in Chardonnay grapes. However, grapes don't have the alcohol acyl transferases that are needed to convert N-hexanol to hexyl acetate. That occurs in the fermentation process when you're making the wine. So the yeast have this enzyme and they can convert the increased production of N-hexanol in the grapes into increased hexyl acetate compounds in the wine and thus increasing the fruity aroma. So you won't necessarily smell this in the grape. You have to ferment the grape and you get this precursor converted into this fruity aroma. Okay, and finally, just in case you're having trouble finding good irrigation supplies, here are a number of producers or suppliers for trellising Jim's Supply, but also they have good irrigation supplies, as well as Western Nevada Supply here in Nevada that have irrigation supplies that you can use for putting together your irrigation drip systems, or you can even go to CalPAC. Well, that's it. I hope you found this video informative and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.